Um, so Katie Woods is a public historian with the National Parks of Boston, researching undertold stories of the park and sharing them through public programs and digital content. Um, you received your Master of Arts in Public History from Northeastern University in May 2019 and a Certificate in Digital Humanities from Northeastern with the uh, digital project focused on Luxembourg, U.S. World War II history and memory from Grateful Friends, uh, which you collaborated on with Megan Woods. Um, also, uh, Katie worked with the LACS as a citizenship advocate and currently serves on our board of directors. Great. Uh, perfect. Well, thank you, Serena, uh, for having me and for everyone tuning in. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. In October of 1893, American suffragist Lucy Stone lay bedridden in her home outside of Boston. After close to five decades of working for the rights of women and other oppressed groups, her age and poor health had finally caught up to her. As her daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell, tended to Lucy in her final hours, she whispered to her daughter one final call to action, make the world better. While it would take another 27 years for the 19th Amendment to be enshrined in the United States Constitution, Lucy Stone had served as a loyal foremother to the movement laying the groundwork for so many who followed her. In the days that followed Lucy Stone's death, the country recognized her significant contributions to the movement. Suffrage leader Elizabeth Cady Stanton recognized, quote, Lucy Stone was the first person by who the heart of the American public was widely and deeply stirred on the woman question. The noted activist Frederick Douglass declared her, quote, a tower of strength to the woman's movement. Obituaries span newspapers across the country, with the Washington Post calling her the first woman suffragist. And even all the way in Wisconsin, the Milwaukee Journal declared Lucy's death left, quote, a vacancy in ranks of women suffragists that will not be easily filled. And that, quote, only those who have followed the progress of women's rights, know in what great measure Lucy Stone contributed by years of hard work, years of abuse and ridicule, to the advancement of a cause in which she so thoroughly believed. So even with these few examples, we see the supposed indelible mark Lucy Stone left on the country. But let me ask you a question. How many of you have heard of Lucy Stone before today or before this conference? And I believe Serena set up a poll so we can actually ask you. Let's see if I can figure out. Oh, perfect. Great, so just select one of the following. And I'm curious to see what your responses are. Um, the options are, I've never heard of her before. Her name sounds familiar, but I don't know much about her. Or I know all about Lucy Stone. So I think if we can end the poll in a minute or a few seconds. Great, interesting. Yeah, so that was kind of what I was expecting, a mix between I've never heard of her before, or, you know, she sounds familiar, but I don't really know much about her. And I think that's a good kind of starting point as we begin to talk about her. Thank you, Serena. In her time, Lucy Stone was widely regarded as, oh, are we, are we good to go? Yep, perfect, great. In her time, Lucy Stone was widely regarded as the third pillar of the women's rights movement, alongside Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. She spent her entire life pushing the boundaries, breaking the rules of tradition, and fighting to extend the rights of women and others to create a more just society. Why is it that so many Americans don't recognize her name today? Why has she not been given a proper place in our public memory of the US women's suffrage movement? Today, we are going to spend some time exploring the life and contributions of Lucy Stone, a woman who dedicated her life to making the world better. And we will consider why she has been largely left out of the national memory of women's suffrage. Born on August 13th, 1818 in West Brookfield, Massachusetts, you can see with the red dot right there in the center of the state, Lucy Stone grew up on a farm in which traditional values persisted. When she was born, Lucy's mother was known to have said, quote, 
Oh dear, I am sorry it is a girl. A woman's life is so hard. According to historian Joelle Millon, Lucy Stone grew up during the era when the notion of separate spheres developed in New England. Women had difficult access to divorce, no rights over their children, and limited job opportunities. They had no claim to their own wages or property. They could not sign contracts or engage in legal uh, business tra transactions or legal documents. This was all in addition to women's lack of political representation, no right to vote, hold office, or serve on juries. As she grew, Lucy saw the unjust ways the women around her were treated by both law and society. She most keenly felt this status herself when it came to her schooling. As she saw her older brothers attend college, she also wanted to follow that path. And whether Lucy realized it or not, equal access to education became her foray into women's rights. She wrote to one of her brothers, quote, only let females be educated in the same manner and with the same advantages that males have. And as everything in nature seeks its own level, I would risk that we would find out our quote, appropriate sphere. However, her father did not want to pay to send his daughter to an institution of higher education, uh, what he thought to be a useless expenditure considering a woman would eventually marry and spend her life within the home. It took Lucy nine years of earning money as a school teacher to afford to attend Oberlin Collegiate Institute in Ohio in 1843, which had opened its doors to women six years before in 1837. At Oberlin College, Lucy Stone worked hard earning money as a teacher outside of her studies. Lucy also found her voice too. She founded a women's debate, debate club when the male debate groups refused to allow women to participate. And she gave her first public speech in celebration of the West Indies Emancipation Day. After this talk, the ladies board composed of professors' wives reprimanded her, saying it was unwomanly for her to speak on such a platform. But Lucy felt her calling and she decided she would spend her life using her voice to speak for women's rights and anti-slavery causes. Graduating in 1847, Lucy became the first Massachusetts woman to obtain a college degree. Both William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass, well-known abolitionists, happened to attend her graduation as they were lecturing on abolition in the city. Their attendance foreshadowed Lucy's future career. In a letter to his wife, Garrison shared his first impression of Lucy. Quote, among others with whom I have become acquainted is Miss Lucy Stone, who has just graduated. She is a very superior young woman and has a soul as free as the air and is preparing to go forth as a lecturer, particularly in vindication of the rights of women. Soon after graduating, Lucy Stone began her career as a lecturer for the Anti-Slavery Society. With the abolitionists, Lucy felt among her people. She especially aligned herself with the few other women on the anti-slavery lecture, lecture circuit saying, quote, the anti-slavery women I think are more intelligent than most women. At any rate, they have thought more and they talk good sense. However, something inside Lucy drew her to speaking on the causes of women as well, believing, quote, I can do more to help elevate women. Lucy Stone therefore began injecting her anti-slavery lectures with numerous points concerning women's rights. When a representative of the Anti-Slavery Society, Samuel May, asked her to only speak on the topic of slavery, Lucy replied, quote, I was a woman before I was an abolitionist and I must speak for the woman. With this pledge, she made a deal with abolitionists to lecture on behalf of the anti-slavery cause on Saturdays and Sundays, what they considered to be the big le uh, lecture ticket days, while the rest of the week she spoke on women's rights. Throughout the, the 1840s and 1850s, Lucy Stone traveled across the country, organizing lectures and speaking to a variety of audiences. She became one of the most well-known lecturers on the cause of abolition and women's rights. Her travels brought her to the Midwest numerous times, and I've been able to confirm that she lectured in Wisconsin at least in 1853, 1855, and 1856. Uh, you see here on the left is an editorial from the Weekly Racing Advocate, and it's praising her work, and this was published in 1854 for a lecture in Chicago. Lucy Stone became greatly respected by both audiences and other activists. Uh, Frederick Douglass acknowledged Lucy was, quote, one of the most attractive and effective advocates for anti-slavery, 
and no one, quote, arrested more attention than did Lucy Stone. An editorial letter in the Mineral Point Tribune uh, commented on her talks in Madison in 1855, saying, quote, I heard one young man say he believed some were converted upon hearing her. On the subject of women's rights, I suppose she said some strong things, and her appearance gave a good impression on the subject of female public speaking. Lucy Stone biographer Sally McMillan notes that Lucy Stone's success lay in part to her sincerity of convictions, her clear persuasion through logical arguments, and her ability to capture an audience through her storytelling. With her esteemed position as a lecturer, Lucy Stone became one of the main figures of the early women's rights movement. It may be difficult for us to understand how a lecturer could have that level of influence, but in the mid 1850s, popular lecturers, including Lucy Stone, would be kind of equivalent to our pop stars of today. A lot of people knew about them. As a leader in this movement, Lucy Stone helped organize women's rights conventions that occurred throughout the country during the 1850s. After the first convention on women's rights in Seneca Falls in 1848, uh, which Dr. McBride mentioned yesterday, uh, a lot of people saw that conventions were an effective way for women to congregate. Lucy Stone played a principal role in the first national women's rights convention held in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1850. This convention brought to Worcester over 1,000 delegates representing 11 states. And during this convention, women and men spoke on the many inequalities of women, including but not limited to suffrage, access to higher education, access to certain professions, uh, the right to own property, among other uh, issues as well. Newspaper accounts, while mixed, drew lots of widespread attention to the early women's rights movement. The success of this event led to, the national, con to national conventions being held annually throughout the country over the next decade. While some activists disagreed over the true effectiveness of these conventions, many believe these yearly conventions proved essential to laying the groundwork for the, for the movement, bringing together women from across the country to discuss women's rights issues. Lucy Stone's passion for women's causes translated into her personal life as well. While Lucy never believed she would marry, as she did not want to submit to any person, she fell in love with a merchant from Ohio named Henry Blackwell. After years of courting, Blackwell won her over by willingly pledging himself to the causes she cared so deeply about. For their marriage in 1855, the two wrote and published a marriage protest, opposing the laws of marriage that required women to obey their husbands. I've included the full protest here, but I'll just read the main paragraph aloud. Quote, while we acknowledge our mutual affection, by publicly assuming the sacred relationship of husband and wife, yet in justice to ourselves and a great principle, we deem it a duty to declare that this act on our part implies no sanction of, nor promise of voluntary obedience to, such of the present laws of marriage as refuse to recognize the wife as an independent rational being, while they confer upon the husband an injurious and unnatural superiority, investing with him legal powers which no honorable man would exercise and which no man should possess. And then they go on to protest specific laws regarding husbands and wives. So while the marriage protest in itself, you know, was widely published and considered radical by many, Lucy took an even more radical step, and that is by keeping her maiden name and not taking her husband's. Uh, she did this after checking with lawyers and finding that it was completely legal, uh, she did so, and that kind of helped to start a new tradition that we carry on today. And this truly was widely unheard of. She was one of the first activists, if not the first activist, to keep her maiden name um, and not include her husband's name in any part of her name. She would sign legal documents saying Lucy Stone, comma, wife of Henry Blackwell. And she would make a point to correct anyone who called her Mrs. Blackwell. Together, Lucy and Henry moved around in the early years of their marriage as Lucy continued to lecture. And we see here on the left, uh, an example of a lecture held at Young's Hall in Milwaukee in 1855. Notice that they advertise her Mrs. Lucy Stone Blackwell. I'm sure if she saw that, uh, she would have not been pleased. They even temporarily moved to Viroqua, Wisconsin in May 1856, as Henry Blackwell had bought land in Wisconsin, hoping to sell it at a profit. 
They stayed here until after her Midwest lecture tour finished in the fall, in which she visited towns in Wisconsin, including Racine, Milwaukee, Madison, and Janesville. Uh, there's, I found this great historical marker in Viroqua, and I'll just read it aloud. Here, July 4th, 1856, Lucy Stone Morning Star of the Women's Rights Movement delivered the first women's rights address and anti-slavery speech ever given by a woman in the great Northwest. The platform broke down. Rising unhurt, she cried, so will this nation fall unless slavery is abolished. The world for women has been revolutionized, largely through the efforts of Lucy Stone and her co-workers. In 1857, Lucy Stone gave birth to the pair's only child, Alice Stone Blackwell. Raising Alice over the next few years took her temporarily away from the movement. Despite this break, Lucy had already cemented her status as an organizer and leader of the women's rights movement. Her oratory during the 1850s on the anti-slavery and women's rights lecture circuits had made her nationally renowned. As the New York Tribune commented, quote, the public mind instinctively fastens upon this little person as being what she really is, the heart and soul of this crusade. While the Civil War put the movement on standby, questions arose following the war that led Lucy Stone under, on a diverging path from many of the other leaders of the strengthening suffrage movement primarily Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Uh, Lizzie mentioned this rift yesterday, and so I'm gonna be going a little bit more in depth today. Back in the 1850s and early 1860s, Lucy Stone had formed strong working relationships with both Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. She became particularly close with Anthony, as in the early years, they were both single women, making a living, advocating for justice for women. Uh, Lucy Stone said of Anthony, quote, she is the bravest woman I know. I love her dearly. Anthony wrote to Stone saying, quote, you are doing an amount of good rarely exceeded by any laborer in the reforms. In the years following the Civil War, their close relationship started to crumble. This arose primarily out of the question of universal suffrage, suffrage that would not be limited by a person's race or sex. During this period, Lucy Stone gave numerous lectures to advocate for universal suffrage. Along with Stanton, Anthony, and other former abolitionists, Stone helped to form the American Equal Rights Association, known as ERA, in 1866, which focused on winning universal suffrage. And we see here a memorial sent to Congress by ERA, uh, petitioning for granting suffrage to all, regardless of race or sex. However, it became clear that many decided to focus on securing the citizenship and voting rights of African American men excluding women. Abolitionist Wendell Phillips called on women to wait when he declared, quote, one question at a time, the hour belongs to the Negro. While Lucy Stone at first objected to this notion, she soon and eventually realized that it was more important to secure the rights of African Americans, agreeing with the likes of Frederick Douglass and others who pointed to the urgency of protecting African Americans still being terrorized in the South. Stanton and Anthony, however, remained stubbornly in support of, this amend of an amendment that would grant suffrage to women, and they did so at any cost. This led them to expect money from and campaign alongside financier George Francis Train, a racist Democrat in 1867, and this was to the surprise and disdain of many of their abolitionist colleagues. Stanton, in particular, began making egregious statements, complaining that educated white women should have had access to the vote before African-American men, immigrants, and working class laborers. And Anthony also made some ter terrible statements as well, uh, one of which we saw yesterday. While Lisa Stone may have sympathized with their frustration and even agreed that women had paid their due and deserved the vote, she really could not support them. She believed progress for some meant progress for all. And she was willing to put the fight for her own rights on hold if it meant someone who had greater need of these rights would have a higher likelihood of succeeding. As Stanton noted, quote, Mrs. Stone felt the slaves' wrongs more deeply than her own. My philosophy was more egotistical. As a result, Lucy Stone took the actions of her allies in the cause quite personally, and the relationship of the triumvirate began to deteriorate rather quickly. 
The debate over women's suffrage versus black male suffrage continued over the next few years, culminating in a final debate at the May meeting of the American Equal Rights Association in 1869. Specifically, this debate questioned whether the association should support the 15th Amendment, which, when ratified, would grant African-American men the right to vote. Tensions rode high, as Stanton and Anthony, among a small group of dissenters, wanted to reject the amendment because it did not include women, while Lucy Stone, Frederick Douglass, and others supported this amendment as a dire necessity. During this meeting, Frederick Douglass echoed the argument spoken earlier of the need to focus on African-American men first before devoting efforts to women. He declared, quote, I must say that I do not see how anyone can pretend that there is the same urgency in giving the ballot to women as to the Negro. With us, the matter is a question of life or death. It is a matter of existence, at least in 15 states of the Union. When women, because they are women, are hunted down through the cities of New York, New York and New Orleans, when they are objects of insult and outrage at every turn, when they are in danger of having their homes burnt down over their heads, when their children are not allowed to enter schools, then they will have an urgency to obtain the ballot equal to our own. After two decades of cooperation and a united front, it was in this moment that the suffrage movement split into two factions. Stanton and Anthony first created the National Women's Suffrage Association, known as NWSA, and it was headquartered in New York, and we see the constitution of it on the left here. While Lucy Stone and other abolitionists turned suffragists who supported the 15th Amendment, including Henry Ward Beecher, William Lloyd Garrison, and Julia Ward Howe, just to name a few, uh, they created the American Women's Suffrage Association, the AWSA, headquartered in Boston. These two associations differed in objectives, tactics, and membership. NWSA had a broad campaign of demands, focusing on property rights, divorce rights, women's suffrage, among others. Uh, the AWSA, while it supported those more gen general women's rights issues, they focused primarily on women's suffrage. The NWSA focused on passing a federal amendment on women's suffrage, while AWSA believed in creating a grassroots organization within the states to grant suffrage on a state level. NWSA had a much more limited membership, while AWSA had a much larger and more expansive membership that included men in leadership positions as well. And you can kind of get a sense by this image on the right here for an AWSA event in Minneapolis. And eventually NWSA did begin to expand its membership and include men in leadership positions as well. So many historians argue that NWSA was a more radical organization, but I, I truly feel like this is up for debate. Um, while there were radical elements of NWSA, uh, I think that the AWSA does have some more radical and forward thinking elements, particularly as many of its leaders had, you know, were rooted in this abolitionist ideals of uh, uh, broader views of equality and justice. Uh, so I think that deserves some attention there. These two organizations remained at odds with each other for the following two decades. No longer a full-time lecturer, Lucy Stone now spent most of her time in Boston, accepting her calling as a leader of AWSA, as well as holding leadership positions in the New England Women's Suffrage Association and the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association. She held meetings, she gave speeches, organized suffrage bazaars, assisted in suffrage campaigns throughout the United States, and coordinated a variety of other suffrage-related activities. Uh, one of which it, you see on the left here is a ticket to the New England Women's Tea Party. So this was held on the 100 year anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. Uh, and it really celebrated the ideals that were mentioned and talked about during the revolution and arguing for those ideals to be expanded to include women 100 years later. And, and Lucy Stone helped organize as well as spoke at that event. Lucy Stone also started the Women's Journal, which became a nationally and even internationally recognized suffrage publication. The journal published national and international suffrage news, highlighted the struggles and successes of women, and became a platform for women writers and journalists. Decades later, suffrage leader Carrie Chapman Catch called the journal, quote, a history maker and history recorder for the suffrage cause. The personal relationship between Lucy Stone and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony remained icy, as each side blamed the other for the split in the movement. This likely occurred due to the stubbornness of the three women, 
Lucy herself even said of the relationship, quote, I am too busy with the work that remains to take time to mend broken cisterns. It was not until 1887 that talks of the unifying the organizations began. Lucy Stone's daughter and representative of the next generation of suffragists, Alice Stone Blackwell, served as an intermediary between the two sides. It took several years before the triumvirate agreed on the formation of a new organization in 1890 called the National American Woman Suffrage Association. And this was the suffrage organization that took women to the 19th Amendment. Despite the success, old habits die hard, Lucy Stone argued fervently for new leaders to take charge of this organization, saying in a letter to her friend and sister-in-law, Antoinette Brown Blackwell, quote, probably it would be best to let Mrs. Stanton, Susan, and I be honorary members who never hold office, the work devolving on younger people. With this, she recognized the need to hand over the reins to the next generation of suffragists, as well as bury the hatchet between the two sides, which she felt could only truly happen if they all took a step back. Anthony, Anthony and Stanton overruled her. Stanton took over as president of this organization and Anthony served as vice president. Lucy Stone never played a significant role in this organization. While a small reason might have been that uh, the residual hurt feelings she felt towards Stanton and Anthony, her health was also declining. In the final year, she tried to remain as active as possible, yet she knew her years of service were coming to an end. While disappointed to know that she would not see full suffrage granted to women, Lucy remained grateful and hopeful. She wrote to William Lloyd Garrison Jr., son of the great abolitionist in 1892, one year before her death, quote, I am glad I was born and that at a time when the world needed the service I could give. Lucy Stone leadership and decades of service to the cause of women's rights made her a beacon of light to the younger generations. Yet, a hundred years on, why is she often left out or given a minimal role in our historical memory of suffrage? So in order for us to understand how Lucy Stone is remembered, we have to look back at who constructed the history of suffrage. And at the very beginning, it was Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Recognizing the importance of history and memory, Anthony and Stanton, along with another suffragist, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, began to write a multi-volume history of the women's suffrage movement in the 1880s, no decades before the 19th Amendment would be ratified. Lucy found this pursuit ridiculous, commenting on the project in a letter to Stanton, quote, in regard to the history of women's rights movement, I do not think it can be written by anyone who is alive today. She argued, quote, there will come a time when this greatest of all world movements will have made history and then it can be written. Lucy Stone also objected to the one-sided nature of the project, saying, quote, your wing surely are not competent to write the history of our wing, nor should we be of yours. This note clearly foreshadows what was to happen. Ignoring these comments, Stanton and Anthony continued with their project. In doing so, they constructed the history of the early women's suffrage movement as they saw it. They provided a simplified history that put themselves and their organization on center stage, effectively limiting the contributions of Lucy Stone and the AWSA. They also conveniently left out the stickier aspects of their early activism, cleansing the history of its tensions. I will say that Lucy Stone does hold partial blame for this. Instead of both dismissing this project and refusing to participate in it, she could have advocated for the inclusion of herself in her organization to, in, to ensure that their contributions would be equally recognized. But she found this project inappropriate for the time and believed others would write a better history later on. In addition to this, Lucy Stone was never one who basked in attention. Uh, her daughter recognized this trait of Lucy, remarking, quote, Lucy Stone was one of the mo most modest and self-effacing of women. She had no thirst for fame. She kept no record of her work, did not save her press clippings, and when importuned to furnish particulars of her life or books of famous women, refused almost with horror. This noble trait sometimes frustrated her colleagues who felt that she deserved more recognition. So while Lucy Stone's disinterest in public recognition and widespread attention no doubt contributed to the way she has been or has not been remembered, I would say it's only an element of why she's been left out of the narrative. 
Shortly after publication, the volumes of History of Women's Suffrage became the eminent works of suffrage history, setting in stone for decades the history of the suffrage movement as told by these two women and their supporters. Their history became ingrained in popular memory, and many scholars referenced and continue to reference these works in scholarship, even though the volumes are largely biased and left out the participation of numerous suffragists, particularly African-American suffragists. We see this most clearly in the argument over the start of the national organized suffrage movement. Anthony and Stanton declared the small regional convention at Seneca Falls in 1848 as the beginning of the national movement. Um, and, and while that is a significant event, especially with the Declaration of Sentiments uh, that we heard about yesterday, um, others pointed to the first national con conference in Worcester two years later as the true beginning. Yet today, what do we remember? We remember Seneca Falls and not Worcester. Historian Sally McMillan sums up this point best as she notes, quote, these volumes presented and perpetuated an inaccurate view of the early women's rights movement and its most significant players. Stanton and Anthony made themselves the movement's 19th century heroines, a view that continues today. While Lucy's uh, daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell, tried to amend this historical memory by writing a biography of her mother's life in 1930 called Lucy Stone, Pioneer of Women's Rights. It could not eclipse the status of the history of women's suffrage. By then, the Stanton and Anthony construction of the history of women's suffrage, the end of which they did not even live to see themselves, had already taken hold. They made themselves the primary 19th century leaders of the suffrage movement, reducing the triumvirate down to a diumvirate. Despite his historical memory failing to give Lucy Stone her proper due in the history of the US women's suffrage movement, her legacy is unmistakable. As one of the first female lecturers, she helped open a public space for women's voices. As an abolitionist, she had an expansive view of equality that few others shared. As a leader of suffrage organizations, she garnered grassroots support for the cause. And as a founding mother of the women's suffrage movement, Lucy Stone helped lay the groundwork for its success. As the Boston Globe printed in her obituary, quote, it has taken the best part of a century to produce a Lucy Stone, but the good she has accomplished will be carried all along all the centuries to come. Thank you. I, uh, just to get things started, I do have a quick, well, may or may not be quick question for you. Um, do you know, do we have any evidence of how Lucy viewed European suffrage movements? We have, from what I have, it's fairly limited, um, but where I find the most information is actually through uh, her role as an editor of the Women's Journal. Um, she oftentimes wrote about other women's rights movements in Europe, um, particularly in Germany, I think was, was one of the places that she referenced the most, as well as in the UK. Um, so I don't, I don't know how much you really can tell from those publications, but at least she did want to include those stories and use them as ways to understand what they were doing to compare tactics. And that's actually something that we see much later on in the common suffrage movement as looking at other tactics in Europe and bringing them over to the um, United States as well. Okay, great. And then to move on, a uh, question from Diane. Was Lucy Stone a Quaker? Um, she was not. Um, some, some early women's rights activists were Quakers. Um, she actually has kind of a mixed relationship with religion and with uh, religious beliefs. Some of her family members were more religious than she was, um, but she wasn't particularly religious. Okay. Great. Uh, and then from Sam, where do you happen to know where exactly in Viroqua the stone is located? Um, you can look it up for historical marker, Lucy Stone. It's it's by a cemetery. Okay. But, yeah, but it is marked right. in Google Maps as a um, as kind of a point of interest. Oh, oh, well, that's good. That's so cool. All yeah. right. No, that it was great when I found that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, also from Diane, um, great presentation. Are there books that you would recommend that would include the, the Worcester Conference? I feel like I said that wrong. 
Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> And I learned how to pronounce all of these things. <laughs> um, one resource that I would suggest, um, a lot of Lucy Stone's biographies would include some information on the Worcester Co Conference. I would actually suggest the Library of Congress does have information and original um, printouts of speeches from the Worcester Conference. Um, so that would be actually, if you wanna get to the primary sources, I would suggest the Library of Congress. Um, but if you want more, if a list of books, Serena, I can always send you a, a list of um, sources to pass out. I, I was actually, because there's another question um, about uh, history books and resources. So uh, if you want to send me a list of what you used, that would be great. And if anybody, um, anybody in the audience would like to send me an email and ask uh, if you would like that list, I can share it with you. Uh, yes that was that was the next question <laughs> all right um so the next question is from michael in your view how important was the role that alice paul in the passage of the 19th how important was the role that alice paul played in the passage of the 19th amendment some give her more credit than others was that because of the split in the movement over tactics yeah so that's actually another split <laughs> later on in the movement so we have the early split um, over the 15th, largely over the 15th Amendment. And then we have the kind of a later split. And because Alice Paul, she works with the main organization, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, um, early on in the early 1900s. Uh, but then after spending a few months in Europe, particularly in England, and learning their tactics of the militant suffragettes and realizing that the main organization wasn't really willing to kind of go that extra step. Um, she forms her own National Women's Party um, with Lucy Burns. And I would say it def they definitely deserve a role in the suffrage story. And, I, and that's why I, I always hesitate to have like a broad view of suffrage just because there are so many different aspects and um, really, really interesting stories. And everyone played a significant role in the fight for the vote. And I would say Alice Paul, as well as the Nash members of the National Women's Party, drew uh, widespread attention. While a lot of people didn't like what they were doing and thought that they were being too radical, um, there are, a lot of historians do say that they they did play a significant role in drawing attention, forcing politicians to kind of take a stance. And so I would say, I think we would eventually have gotten there anyways, but I think they definitely kept it in the minds of the public with their, um, you know, getting jailed, um, living in terrible conditions in jails, like a lot of that drew a lot of widespread attention to the suffrage movement and their cause, especially in the final years. Okay. And then um, kind of on that note, um, what became of Alice Paul? How, how did she continue in the... So she continued with the National Women's Party following the ratification of the 19th Amendment, and she was the first one to, to advocate for the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, so that started in the early 1920s, that movement. So she was part of that early movement. So a lot of suffragists, you know, the fight wasn't over for them. While the 19th Amendment was a significant moment, a lot of women continued working um, for greater rights. And Alice Paul was definitely one of them. Okay. And then uh, another question um, is more for you personally uh what drew you to lucy stone's history and to pick kind of her out of everybody else involved in the in the suffrage movement yeah so um i work with the national parks of boston so lucy stone is kind of one of our you know figure historical figures that we hold up and i'm just i really am fascinating by her story and then the fact that she's never talked about you know outside of massachusetts few people know her maybe you know she's a line in a textbook um, but I think what fascinates me most about her story is just the way that she has been left out, even though in the early years, she was the woman's rights advocate that people knew about. Um, she helped get Susan Anthony involved in the suffrage movement. Um, she was really one of the pivotal figures of the early women's rights movement. So I, I, I'm fascinated by her story, her connection to abolition, uh, working alongside a lot of African-American activists and later suffragists. Um, so I, I appreciate her kind of broader vision for equality and justice um, based on who needed it at the time. Interesting. Unfortunately, we are out of time now. Um, 
But uh, thank you so much for telling us a little bit more about somebody we may not have heard of. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you.